Hello there, goobers. Today we're going to be creating a dialogue system using GameMaker Studio 2. We'll be using structs and methods, taking full advantage of the tools introduced in the 2.3 update. Would you like to get started? Uh, well, that's the only thing this video is about. Let's try that again. Would you like to start? Great, let's dive right in. Uh, you can see that we don't really have much to start with. I only have a font for drawing our text, and I have a sprite to act as our text box. This sprite is a nine slice, so it's able to stretch across the screen, and it's going to act as the backdrop for our text box to render text onto. Uh, you can see we have absolutely no code to start with, and just an empty room that'll just contain a demo object later. So let's get started by creating a text box object. I'm going to make a new object and I'm going to call it OBJ text box. We're going to want to give it that sprite that we have already in our sprites folder. And we need to define some variables. So let's add a create event and start adding in the customizable variables that you can edit to change the way it looks and also the private internal variables that it needs to run correctly. We're going to put the customizable variables at the top of our create events so that they're a little easier to find. And the first one we'll define is just an input variable. So this is going to be the button that we press to advance to the next page. Next, we're going to add some variables that control the positions of things. So margin is going to control how much space the box has from the edges of the screen. And padding is going to control how much space things inside the text box have. So like how far from the edge the text itself is going to be drawn inside the box. Width and height are going to be set based on first the, uh, the GUI's size, and then we're subtracting margin from each side, left and right. That's why we're multiplying by two, one for left, one for right. And height is going to be controlled by the height of the sprite that we defined earlier. Next, we're going to use these variables to position our text box so it's always in the right spot on the screen. So you can see that X is set to the GUI's width minus our own text box width divided by two. So that places the left corner of the text box such that the whole thing will be centered on the screen. Uh, and then the Y position is going to be placed at the GUI height minus our own height. So we're raising the box. Um, such that it's touching the bottom of the screen. But then we're also raising a little bit more based on margin. So there's going to be a little bit of space beneath the text box as well. Now let's declare some variables that control the text itself. So we're going to have a variable that controls what font we're going to use, what color the text is supposed to be, how quickly does it type itself out, where inside the text box the text is going to position itself, and also how wide the area it can type within is. So this is the maximum width the text can reach before it has to drop down to the next line. You can see that it's going to be almost as wide as the text box, but then once again, we're just going to be subtracting the padding from each side so that the text doesn't actually touch against the edge of our text box. It stops a little bit before then. And that's all of the customizable variables that we're going to be defining. Now let's add some internal variables for the underlying system to work. The first set of variables we're going to add is an actions array and a current action variable. The actions array is going to store all of the different actions our text box needs to perform. So mainly this is going to be the pages of text that it's going to write out. But there's other things too that a text box can do. For example, later on we want to maybe add some actions that set what portrait we're using, or who's speaking, or maybe we want to present a set of options to the player to pick from. We're not just storing strings or, or plain text in this array. We're going to be storing structs that contain data specific to what the kind of action is. And we're going to be adding that a little bit later on in this video. Current action stores our position in the actions array, so it's basically what page we're on. We'll initialize current action as negative one just to signify that we haven't started the process yet. Next, we need some internal text variables. So text is going to control what text is currently being shown on the screen. Progress is going to control how much progress we've made typing the text out. So this will gradually increase and gradually fill that text like a typewriter action until all of the text is being displayed on the screen. And text length stores how long our text is. And now we need to add some methods to our text box. If you're not familiar with what a method is, 
It's just a function defined inside an object. Our text box right now needs three methods. We're going to start with the set topic method. This method is just going to start a conversation and tell our text box what the pages of text that we need to render are to have this conversation. All of our dialogue is going to be stored as topics inside a global struct that we'll create in a little bit. Every time a new conversation starts, we'll reset our current action variable, and then we'll call the next method. And to put it simply, this method really just goes on to the next action. You can see that it increases current action by one. And if we are at the end of our array of actions, then we're just going to destroy the text box to close it. But if we're not at the end, then we're going to grab the current action that we're on, and we're going to call the act method inside it. So when we define our actions in a little bit, we're going to be giving each one of them an act method, which is going to be called here. And the very last method that we're going to add to our text box is the set text method. And this really just sets our text. It sets the text variable to whatever text we need to render. It sets the text length variable to the length of that text. And it resets our text progress so that we start typing fresh. And that is everything that goes in the create event for our text box. So now let's go to the step event and add the behavior for our text box. So I'm just going to create a step event. And I'm going to start here by grabbing our input again, just setting a confirm variable using the confirm key that we defined in the create event. I like doing this at the beginning so that it's always available throughout the rest of my code later on. And this step event will be growing as these video episodes continue. So I want this to be as clear cut as possible so everything is easy to add to later on. After that, let's run some code that actually creates the typing effect. So we're going to be increasing text progress by our text speed, but we're going to be capping it so it never gets larger than text length. Now we need to run some code that handles what happens when we press the confirm key. And different things need to happen at different times, because if the text is still typing itself out, then pressing the confirm key should skip that typing process to the end. But if we press the confirm key after everything has typed itself out, then it should advance to the next page of text. So we need to add an if statement that checks if we've actually finished typing our text or not. If we have finished typing our text out, then pressing the confirm key should just make us go to the next page of text. So if we press confirm and we finish typing, then we're going to go to the next page of text. But if we haven't finished typing our text out, then pressing the confirm key should just fast forward that process and set text progress equal to text length. So we've skipped that increasing phase and just cut to the end and made it so that everything is now written out on the page immediately. And that's everything that needs to go in our step event. So we could move on now and add our draw GUI event to draw the text and the box. But before we do, we need to create a function that draws text in a more specific way than the default draw text functions. So the reason why we can't just use the built-in draw text functions directly is because they are not robust enough to do everything we need them to do. First of all, when we later on add things like text effects, changing the color of a word in the middle of our sentence, there's no way that the built-in draw text functions are going to be able to handle that on their own. And as well as that, they aren't going to handle line breaks correctly either. To demonstrate what I mean, let's see what happens when we type normally with the draw text ext function. You can see as we type a large word, like sesquipedalian, for example, it started out typing on the first line, then dropped to the second line, which is no good. It looks kind of jarring. So instead, what we'd like to do is write a function where when we type a long word like that, it begins typing from the second line from the start, instead of partially typing on the first line, then dropping to the next one. So in order to do this, we're going to make a custom function. In our scripts folder, we're just going to make a new script. And I'm going to call this script typing, because it's going to be about typing. And I'm going to create a typing function. So function type. We need to specify where it's supposed to type. 
what text it's supposed to type, how much of the text it needs to type out, and what the maximum width of the area it types in is. So this part is probably going to be the most complicated code that we write in this tutorial. But if we just do it in chunks, I don't think it will be so bad. So I'm going to start with a very simple version of this typing function. And it's just going to type out our text as though it were using the regular draw text function. So I'm going to have a draw x and a draw y variable, which are going to change over time to define like where we draw each letter. We're going to run through the letters one by one, starting at one, because some for some reason strings start at the index one, unlike pretty much everything else in GameMaker. We grab the current character at uh, where we are in the loop, and then we draw it onto the screen, and then we shift over by the width of that character. So if we stopped here, we basically would have just recreated the regular draw text function. So let's add more to it. We're going to add in handling for regular line breaks. So if we ever come across the new line character, which is a backslash followed by an N, then we're going to reset our horizontal drawing position back to the left side, and we're going to shift down our vertical drawing position by the height of a line, which is just going to be like the height of a very large character in our font. We're going to add another block of code in the middle, and this is the complicated part, but if we just do this bit by bit, I'm sure we'll be okay. You can see this only runs when we find a space character, and that's because we're looking to do this at the start of words. And what comes before the start of a word? Well, a space does, because if a letter came before the start of the word, that letter would be part of the word, so it wouldn't be the start. So the only place where we want to insert these new line breaks is on spaces. When we find one, we're going to skip past the space, and then we're going to enter this sort of like sub loop. And you can see it's very similar to the loop that we started with up here. You can see our sub loop uses a different iterating variable, ii instead of i. And we're also going to keep track of how wide the word we're currently looking at is. If we reach the end of the word, so if as we're looking ahead, we find a new line or another space, then we're going to end because that means that we went through this whole loop without actually getting too wide to cause a line break. So we're just going to break out of this sub loop and go back to what we were doing before. If we go past this and we increase our width such that we are getting past the total amount of width that we're allowed to type within, then we're going to do exactly like what we did before when we find a new line character. So you can see we set draw x to zero, just like we do up here. We set draw y. We're increasing by that big letter, capital A, just like we do up here. Armed with this function, we can now create our draw GUI event. But before we do, we're just going to create a regular draw event, but we're not going to put any code in it. We're just going to make it exist to override the default drawing, and that way we won't draw ourselves in the room and only on the GUI. Now let's create the draw GUI event. And the first thing to draw in here is just, well, the box part. So we're just going to draw our sprites stretched out by our width and our height, starting at our corner that we defined in our create events. And then we're going to draw our text. So we're just going to set some basic draw variables. The horizontal and vertical align are going to be top left aligned. We're going to set the fonts to what we specified in our create events, the color. And we're going to use that typing function that we just created to actually type the text out. So that's all of the code that needs to go in object text box. But we still need to create the building blocks for how we're going to write our dialogue. And then we need to write some example dialogue to test this out. So let's start by creating some dialogue actions. I'm going to make a new script again. I'm going to call this script actions. And in here, we're going to put all of those structs that have the act methods that we talked about earlier. The very first one that we're going to create is very simple. It's just going to be called dialogue action. You can see this is a constructor function. So we can call this to create a data struct. And within that struct is going to be basically nothing. There is an act method inside it, and that act method contains literally nothing. This is just going to serve as a template for all of our other dialogue actions to build off of. So for example, the most important dialogue action that we need is the text action. So this action is going to be what we use to define a page of text some text that is going to get typed out by the text box. You can see that 
it inherits from dialog action and it sets its own act method and inside its act method we're calling the set text method that we defined in object text box earlier you can also see that as we construct this text action we're going to tell it what text it's supposed to type out so for example if i wrote like new text action hello world <laughs> uh, then this is going to tell our text box write a page that says hello world but because i don't want to like write out new 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 you know new 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 text action over and over and over i'd like to condense this repeated part a little bit so what i'm going to do is at the top of this script i'm just going to make a macro called text and this is just going to act like i wrote text new text action out uh, this way i don't have to write new text action over and over and over instead we can just specify text 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 this looks a little bit nicer and as we add more dialogue actions later on it'll be a little bit cleaner so now that text action is defined let's write some example dialogue that our text box can actually use so if you recall we store all of our conversations in topics and we're going to put them all in a global topics struct so let's create that struct right now again in another script so i'm going to make a new script and i'm going to call this one script topics and script topics is just going to create an empty struct called global topics so this is just the struct that all of our conversations are going to be stored inside and that way when we make our text box object and tell it what conversation to have it can look them up inside this struct. Now let's create an example topic, and I'm going to call this topic, well, example. So I'm going to make an entry in our topic structs. I'm going to call this entry example, and it's going to be an array of the dialogue actions that we defined in script actions. Right now, we only really have the text action. So let's just add a few pages of text. I'm going to add a few example text pages right now. So as we run the project and we have the example conversation, then the text box is going to type out hello world on one page. Then it's going to type out, I sure hope this dialogue system works first try. And I really hope it does, because if it doesn't, then I have to re-record everything. Then just to make sure that our line breaks are working correctly, I'm just going to have a page of text that has a whole lot of words in it. And this will guarantee that it needs to break a line uh, in order to fit everything on one page. Now, we also need a function that we can call that actually creates the text box and sets the conversation. So let's add a new function to our typing script. I'm going to put it above type because this is the one function that you're going to actually need to call yourself in your project whenever you want to create the text box in the game. This is just going to be called start dialog. And you pass in a topic to it. And it checks if there is already a text box. And if there is, it just stops early because we don't want to have two text boxes going at the same time. We spawn an instance of the text box. We just spawn it really, really high up so that we make sure it's above everything else on the GUI. And then we set the topic calling the set topic method. And with that, we are done coding. So let's just make a demo object that implements this start dialog function so that we can see the text box running in action. I'm going to make a new object. I'm just going to call it like OBJ demo or something. And when I press the space bar, I'm going to start the example dialog that we created. So let's add this object to the room. And let's give it a run. I'm going to press the space bar. Hello world. I'll press space bar again. Looking good so far. Press it again. Seems like it dropped a line exactly where it should have. I'll press space bar again. And that closes the text box. But did you see something weird happen? I'm going to show again. I'm going to press the space bar one more time. The first page didn't actually type its text out. It just immediately wrote hello world. And the reason why is order. So our demo object spawns the text box by pressing the space bar, which creates the text box, which then also checks if the space bar is pressed on the same frame. 
And since it is, it runs its skipping code. So we want to make sure that there's no weird order issues going on on the frame that the text box has created. So we're going to add a little bit of extra code now just to ignore input for the first few frames the text box is active. So we're going to come on over back to the text box. I'm going to open it up. I'm going to open its create events. I'm going to come back over to our input section. And I'm going to add two new lines of code. So I'm going to add a max input delay and an input delay. Max input delay is just going to store how many frames in total we wait before accepting input. And input delay is going to act like a counter that counts down to zero. And when it hits zero, we start accepting input again. Now let's go over to the step event and we'll implement this input delay. So we're going to put this new code right before we do any input checking stuff. So right here above the confirm key parts, we're going to add in an if statement that checks if our input delay is more than zero. And if it is, then we'll count down the input delay by one and we're gonna stop the whole event, which means we're not gonna do any of the input reading part beneath it. When input delay finally decreases down to zero, this if statement stops running and we can start accepting input again. So let's try running the project now with this fix added. And let's try pressing the space bar. Looks like it uh, types out on the first page now. We can also try skipping. So I'm gonna press space twice and you can see that it skips to the end. I'm gonna try skipping this page as well. All good. So we have now fully created our text box system. Real quick, let's also just mess with these customizable variables a bit so you can see what happens if we change them around. Like maybe I'm gonna make the margin really big. I'm going to make the text speed type out really fast. Uh, and let's make the total width that I can type in a lot, a lot thinner as well. Uh, let's run that and just see in action all of the properties changing. So let's make our text box. Hello world, you can see it's quite a bit smaller now. Types a lot faster. And now it's wrap, wrapping the lines way more tightly. So you can edit the text box to look however you want. You can make it you know, feel right whatever works best for your own project. I want to encourage people to mess with the code in here and change it in ways that they see fit. And that's gonna do it for this episode. Later on, we're going to be adding more features to this system. We're going to be adding portraits and we're gonna add a speaker tag. And we're also going to add effects. So like colors of words in the middle of a page changing or maybe the letters waving up and down like a sine wave pattern. We'll also add custom code blocks that can run in the middle of dialogue. So you can do things like set story flags based on decisions that players choose. And of course, we'll also add in branching dialogue and choices that you can make to change how the conversation flows. But for now, I'll see you.